What's up, everybody? My name is Wizard Blade, and after a long hiatus, it's finally time to get back to the direct-to-video Disney sequels. So, which one am I doing this time? Return to all the wonder and majesty of Disney's classic masterpiece as the legacy continues. There he is in his triumphant return. In an all-new action-packed adventure, The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. Oh, no. Well, it's the one you guys voted for. And seeing how you guys have been very patient with me these last few months, it's time I gave you the one you wanted to see the most, Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. The original Hunchback of Notre Dame is considered by many to be one of Disney's best animated films. Not just because it has beautiful animation, wonderful songs, and a beautiful orchestra, and a cast of mostly likable characters, but also because it was the darkest of Disney's animated films. This movie dove into themes of racism, sexuality, religion, spirituality, and even genocide. For a G-rated movie, that's some pretty heavy stuff, and yet the movie did it very well and is remembered and beloved to this day because of it. Let's make the sequel about a circus! Jeez, talk about a jarring change in tone. While the first movie was dark, scary, immature beyond belief, the sequel, on the other hand, is bright, safe, and childish beyond belief. There's a reason why so many people call it one of the worst, if not the worst, direct-to-video Disney sequel. And yes, that means it's even worse than Belle's Magical World. Why do people say that? Well, let's sit down and find out. This is Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. So the movie begins with a song singing about this movie's equivalent to Valentine's Day. And it's actually an okay song. I wasn't expecting the original movie's beautiful score and songs in this movie, but I was at least hoping that one or two of this movie's songs would at least be passable. Le jour d'amour, your song is in the air. What magic will you make for us? What promise will you share? We got one, people. We have one. It's not gonna get better than this, is it? Some have come in puppy love, the chance to steal a kiss. Some are still enamored after years of wedded bliss. Oh, don't make fun of me, okay? It's just my wife. <laughs> Why are you being bashful, dude? That's your wife. You can kiss her whenever you want. With the proper consent, of course. So it's been a few years since the events of the first movie, and Quasimodo is now running around in town, interacting with all the people including the little girl from the end of the first movie, who is still a little kid. Disney, you want to talk about why that kid hasn't aged yet? I think they make a much better movie than the one you're about to show us. The spirits may rise With fire in their eyes While gypsy girls enchant you with a dance! <laughs> oh good! They're back! Because if there's anything this movie about not judging someone based on their appearance needed, it's three assholes who do nothing but judge people based on their appearance. Regardless of how much you love the first movie, you have to admit that the gargoyles were the weakest part of it. They were obnoxious, had the least memorable song, and often went against the movie's core message of not judging someone based on their appearance. Alright, alright! Pour the wine and cut the cheese! Oh, look. A mime. <sighs> I thought I was the cute one. No, you're the fat, stupid one with the big mouth. What are you saying exactly? But with that being said, though, it was pretty debatable as to whether or not they actually existed. It was hinted that the gargoyles were just Quasimodo's imaginary friends as they turned back to stone whenever someone else walked into the room. Along with that, the first movie was pretty dark for a kid's movie, so it kind of made sense to insert some comic levity in there somewhere, even if it wasn't that funny. Yeah, but here they're way worse. Also, they're real. Which means the pain is real, too. Yeah, so much for being ambiguous. In this movie, they are as real as you and me. They mess with the goat, they break shit, they can even interact with other people. What the hell? Way to ruin the one redeeming factor for these assholes, movie. Good job. But at least the gargoyles are mostly in the background of this movie, as opposed to this little shit named Zephyr. Zephyr is the child of Phoebus and Esmeralda, and if you ask me, is the most annoying part of this movie. Don't believe me? Okay, Mom. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! Oh boy! Whoa, it's a circus! 
And you thought Monster High's kids were annoying as shit. <laughs> you just sexually assaulted a goat. How is that not the worst thing in your movie? So Quasimodo is preparing for the Festival of Love, or Le Jour d'Amour, by cleaning a bell by the name of La Fidel, or the Faithful One, which has been bedazzled with a ton of jewels on the inside so that it's beautiful on the inside. Get it? It's so... Oh, profound! Why couldn't you just design the inside of the bell so that it sounds different than the other bells? Wouldn't that make your ham-fisted message make a little more sense? A bejeweled bell won't be able to ring properly, you idiots. Also, the bell is cooped up in a bell tower where practically no one could see it. What is the point of doing this to a bell when hardly anyone's going to see it at all? So Quasimodo is upset because he doesn't have anyone's name to shout at the Le Jour d'Amour, and believes he never will, and goddammit, this is the whole point of the movie, isn't it? You're just giving Quasimodo a girlfriend. I guess the writers for this movie didn't like the fact that Quasi didn't get with Esmeralda at the end of the first movie, but little did they realize that the first movie kinda deviated from the book a little bit. You know, mainly the part where they both died. Did you guys really have to make a movie giving Quasimodo a girlfriend? Really? Was this really necessary? Oh god! Okay, can we please never see handsome Quasimodo ever again? I'll thank you. So thankfully we cut away from ugh, that because the circus is in town! Yay! Ah, mes amis! As part of the Festival d'Amour, a circus has come to Paris! Also, why am I welcoming the circus in town? It's not like I work for them or am sponsored by them. Is this really the only role I have in this movie? You know, I was a little more than just a narrator in the first movie, you know? So, with the circus in town, we then get to meet Sarouche, the ringleader, who is also this movie's Frollo. Yeah, I'm dead serious. This is our new Frollo, guys. <laughs> you remember Frollo, right, guys? Frollo, one of Disney's most badass and sinister villains of all time. Frollo, the guy who murdered a mom and then nearly drowned her baby in the beginning of the first movie. Frollo, the guy who tried to burn down all of Paris all because some woman refused to jump on his old bones. This is him now. Yep, just some random asshole who really likes money. And also himself to a nearly creepy degree. Hmm, hello. <laughs> Ooh, lovely. I could kiss me, but I'd fall in love. I love you, love you, love you, and you. <laughs> You're a genius. I understand that's the point, but how does that make him interesting? Frollo was interesting. He was often conflicted with his actions, trying desperately to convince himself that what he was doing was for the greater good, that his sins would be forgiven, and that the wicked shall be punished. Sarouche is just an asshole who, at the best, would serve fine as a villain for a Saturday morning cartoon, and a filler one at that, not a recurring one that you'd want to see again. God, I'd rather have another twist villain that Disney just loves to obsess over nowadays, like, like Callahan. Yeah, I'll take Callahan again. You know my thoughts on that movie! Along with Sarouche, we also meet Madeline, who is his assistant in the circus, who wants to, get this, walk the tightrope! <laughs> I know they say don't dream too big, but feel free to dream a little big, sister. I, I just want to contribute more to the circus. Your job is to stand there and look pretty. I want to do more. And so you shall, my little Eclair. I have the perfect job for a girl like you. I, I was thinking. <laughs> thinking? <laughs> Not your strong suit, is it, my little bonbon? <laughs> no, it's mine. Yeah, Sarouche is an asshole in case you couldn't get that. So Sarouche plans to steal off Adele because, well, he's an asshole, and he sends Madeline up there to find it. But why doesn't he just go up there himself? I mean, yeah, like, no, there's no rules against it. If Madeline can go up there by herself, why can't he? Don't like that. 
That's one of my pet peeves in animation right there. Rewinding animation frames like that. Like, yeah, we've seen that before, and I really, really hate that. Like, call it nitpicking if you want, but that's one of my pet peeves in animation. Rewinding cycles like that? You could have made the whole thing a smooth animation and replay it over and over again. That would have been fine. That is really awkward and noticeable, and I hate that. So Madeline goes to the bell tower to meet the bell ringer, and Quasimodo, despite having been outside in the town for years now, is suddenly nervous about meeting somebody? I understand that she's a beautiful woman and all, but he's been socializing in the town for years at this point. I think he should be able to talk to a girl by this point. What's so funny? Nothing, it's just... It looks like you're wearing a really big hat. <laughs> oh, the... That sounds silly, doesn't it? No, that was mostly awkward and stupid. Can we please move along from that line? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the gargoyles! Gargoyles. <laughs> and look at Quasi. He's like, oh my god, this woman can see my imaginary friends too? Maybe she's the crazy one and not me. What do you think, Chewie? <laughs> yeah. Crazy. But after Madeline sees Quasimodo, she runs away, frightened by his appearance. Thinking about what it would be like to be with Madeline, he then sings this movie's version of Out There. Only this time, it's ten times worse and way more cheesy. Imagine someone to love who loves you. Imagine to look in her eyes and see. Imagine how miraculous it seems to be. Oh, God, these lyrics are awful. Like, think about every fancy cheese you could possibly imagine, and then have it all be spoiled. And you still had to eat it. Yeah, that's the song in a nutshell. God, some of these lyrics have really creepy overtones about them. Just listen to them. Imagine someone to love who loves you. Uh, that's what crazy people do, Quasi. You sure you want to say that in a kid's movie? Imagine to look in her eyes and see. You mean the terror? Yeah, I can, I can imagine what the terror would look like. Imagine how extraordinary it would be. You mean the terror would be extraordinary? Oh, I do believe it would definitely be extraordinary. Yeah, see how weird this sounds, guys? Hmm, what does one wear to a carnival event? Nothing. Daring! Oh! Maybe a bit pushy for a first date. <laughs> Alright, damn it, that line got a chuckle out of me. Even bad movies can have a funny line here and there. Remember that one from Son of Bigfoot? Hello there, cowboy. What are you in for? Murder. Terrible movie, but a genuinely funny line. So hey, remember from the first movie, there was that one scene where Quasimodo wanted to go outside to the Festival of Fools, and the gargoyles were trying to convince him to just go to it? Well, let's just do that all over again. Like, no, it's practically the same exact scene from the original, only this time, Quasimodo shouldn't have any trouble going to the circus. He's been outside for years, okay? He's been socializing, interacting with everybody. He should have no trouble with this. Okay, nothing should be stopping him from walking up to Madeline and just going... Hey. Well, how do I look? You really want me to answer that for you, Quasi? I'll do you one better. Everyone in the comments below, let me know what you think Quasimodo looks like. It would be hilarious. So while Quasi and the others are walking around the circus, Madeline tells Saru she doesn't want to be part of the job anymore. But I was only six years old. And you were starving. And it was only a few coins. Saru's just kind of an asshole. In case you couldn't figure that out yet. Also, really? That's why Madeline is working for him? She stole from him when she was a kid, and he threatened to turn her over to the police. Like, what would the police do against a six-year-old girl? They'd probably laugh at him at this point. It'd be like, your stupid ass got robbed by a six-year-old girl. What a bitch. I should arrest you, man, for, you know, being a bitch. 
First of all, that was years ago. I don't think the cops would really care about it right now. I thought they could even prove it happened anyway, so why is she working for him now? Secondly, what would the cops have done anyway if he did turn her in? Arrest her? A six-year-old girl. I get it's like the 1400s, but it's a Disney movie. Trust me, guys, at the worst, they probably just take her to an orphanage and nothing more. Hell, knowing Disney, they probably have one of the cops adopt her and give her a wonderful life. Or a happily ever after, so we call it. There's like a million other ways around this, guys. Come on. So Sarisha's show begins, and while everyone is watching it, all of the carnies begin to pickpocket the crowd. Also, why do those gold coins look like they're made out of wood? Whoa! 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 Noises! That means I'm a kid! Whoa! <sighs> so, just when you thought the songs couldn't get much worse in this movie, guess what? The Brat gets a song himself. Ugh. You mean? That's the arithmetic I'd stick with you. It's not terrible, in fact it's pretty damn short, but it's mostly pointless. The cute kid needs to have a song because reasons, and plus Madeline needs to see that Quasi isn't so bad for all despite having already met him. Zephyr. Aw, you finally smothered him to death. Good. So, seeing that he's not so bad after all, Madeline goes up to Quasi, and we then get more awkward flirting. Great. Hmm. You mean... Hocus there pocus? Delusion there illusion? <laughs> <laughs> Abra there cadabra? <laughs> Ugh. Okay, maybe this dialogue could work if these two were, like, preteens, or maybe even young teenagers, but come on, these guys have got to be, like, in their 30s at this point. God. Why can't they talk like normal human beings? Quasi didn't stumble all over himself with Esmeralda in the first movie, so why is he doing it here despite having years of experience with socializing with people? Sure, he was shy in the original movie, but he still talked to her like a normal person. But here, the teenagers from Days and Confuse act more like adults than these two love-struck assholes. So while Quasi and Madeline go out on a date, Phoebus is busy dealing with the people who have been robbed. Bruce, Bruce can you describe the bracelet? All right, all right. <laughs> Alright, that's on you, dumbass, alright? Seriously, who the hell carries their life savings on their person? To a circus, nonetheless. So, while Quasi and Madeline are on their date, the gargoyles notice the two and decide that they need a song, too. <sighs> Jesus Christ, I hope it's at least bearable. He's fa la 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 fallen in love. fa la 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 He's fa la 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 fallen in love. I was wrong! It's not. It's not. Jesus, why are these the gargoyles that Disney gives so much attention to and not these ones? So of course the whole city has to sing about Quasi finally having a girlfriend. They stand under a full moon, dance in the rain, all within the time span of a minute, and also go through people? I didn't know love could do that. Chewie, you lie to me! <laughs> so going back into the church, Madeline goes to dry off while the gargoyles go to speak to Quasi. <gasps> Thank you. You're welcome. Hey! Ooh. Yeah. They can just do that. Like the imaginary friends they were supposed to be. So, while exploring the church, Madeline finally finds La Fidel. Gee, try saying that three times real fast. Finally finds La Fidel. Finally finds La Fidel. Finally finds La Fidel. It was way harder in my head. But she's even more beautiful. On the inside. It's honestly kind of a gimmick, if you ask me. I'll show you. This must be worth a fortune. <sighs> I never realized how big Sarish's forehead was. Or that his hairline is very Vegeta-ish. So the two head over to the fire, and Madeline asks Quasi a very important question. Do you really think there's more to me than what you see? That I have something else to give? I do. Really? Well then, care to share with us? Care to share with her? Because if I'm being honest with you, Quasi, I don't see it. I don't see a damn thing with this girl. Not one thing. 
Outside of wanting to walk the tightrope and being a bit clumsy, what is there to Madeline's character? Sure, we know she's being forced to work for Sarouche, but like I said earlier, that can easily be solved ten ways to Sunday, so what else is there to Madeline's character? You understand the world better than anyone I've ever known. Do you really think so? I do. That line coming from a circus performer who has been all over the world at this point. Yeah, Quasimodo goes outside now, but he's only seen Paris. Madeline has gotten to see everywhere else. Shouldn't the line have sounded a little bit more like this? I've been all over the world, Quasimodo, and yet I don't know how, but you seem to understand the world so well when I don't seem to get it myself sometimes. Yeah, that line should sound more confused and intrigued as opposed to amazed and whimsical. That makes Madeline sound more like she's, oh, I don't know, boring? Really boring? And that, my friends, is the biggest problem with this movie about giving Quasimodo a girlfriend. The girlfriend is boring as shit. There is so little character here, and the stuff that could have been interesting was nothing more than just a few throwaway lines said by Sarouche earlier. <sighs> There's got to be a way to fix this character. There has got to be a way to fix this character. Because there is so little here, you could do whatever you want with this character, and it would work fine. <sighs> but what would you do, though? Hmm. What would you do, though? Hmm. I got it. My version of Madeline would actually want to be a part of Sarouche's crew. He's not forcing her to do anything. In fact, Sarouche would be so impressed by her skill of robbing people at such a young age, he would actually offer her a spot on the circus himself. And she, of course, would happily accept. Because, to be honest, she does like money, she does like the thrill of robbing people, and she does love getting away with it. But here's the bottom line, though. She does have a moral center to her. She only robs people who would be fine afterwards, never truly wants to hurt anyone, and at times would even give money to those who need it more. This of course would be where Madeline and Sarouche often clashed, as Sarouche doesn't have a moral center and doesn't care about who gets hurt in the process. And now we've come to the events of the film where Madeline meets Quasimodo for the first time. Unlike in the movie, my Madeline would be thrilled to have this opportunity to rob that bell, and sees it as the heist of a lifetime. But just like in the movie, she'd be frightened by Quasimodo's appearance and run off. But, unlike in the movie, my Madeline wouldn't run off to Sarouche, rather, he would find her and wonder what happened. This is when Sarouche would doubt her ability to do this and offer to do the job himself. Realizing that Sarouche would use force to steal the bell, and despite Quasi's appearance, Madeline wouldn't want him to get hurt and tell Sarouche that she'll get it. Like in the movie, the two would meet up after the circus and get to know each other properly, and along the way, she would learn what the bell, La Fidel, would mean to the people of Paris, and that it's more to them than just a bell that looks nice. Also, I wouldn't have the bell be bedazzled. I'd simply have it be a normal bell that just so happens to look a little funky. Maybe just have it be a really old, rusty bell, but it creates a very unique sound. The only reason why Sarouche and Madeline would think that the bell is worth a fortune is because everyone in Paris keeps talking about how great it is. So when Madeline sees the bell for the first time, she's honestly a little disappointed about it. But then Quasi would decide to ring it once just for her, and then she would understand that there's more to the bell than its appearance. Just like how there's more to Quasi than his appearance. She would then begin to value the important things in life, like, for example, doing good things and being with the right people. This is just brainstorming, guys, but I think this would work way better. The message would be way less ham-fisted, plus Madeline would actually have an arc. So, of course, Quasimodo has fallen in love with Madeline, but doesn't know what to do about it, even though he should at this point. And he goes to see Esmeralda for advice. Esmeralda, you gotta help me. Again, Disney, are we not gonna talk about the fact that that little girl has yet to age since the first movie? She's clearly immortal. Where the hell is her movie, Disney? That would be way more interesting to watch. So another minute wasted, telling us stuff we already know, blah 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 blah. But then Phoebus shows up being the only smart person in this movie after having deduced that the circus is behind all the robberies. And yet, despite it being obvious, everybody just treats Phoebus like he's a racist prick. Those people... Those people? How can you lump people together like that? But the gypsies weren't guilty of crimes like these circus people. A very good point! Madeline's not. She's different. Well, maybe. 
And maybe she's just using you to get something else. Also possible? And actually turns out to be kind of true. But look at the facts. Find some, then I will. He just did. Look, Quasi, don't get mad at Phoebus just because you're using your other head to think. Clouded, this boy's vision. By his boner, it is. This was a recurring theme throughout the film that Phoebus, for some reason, didn't like the circus or trust the carnies, which feels very uncharacteristic of him. In the first movie, yeah, he followed Frollo's orders, but it wasn't like he fully agreed with them, and when Frollo started going too far, he flat out refused and was almost killed for it. While granted he's correct in his suspicions of the circus, and it makes sense for him to suspect the circus, it still doesn't feel like something he would just blindly do from the start, and yet, at the same time, he was right to do so. So, movie, are you telling me that it's actually okay to lump people together like that? Black people, Jews, Mexicans? I can make fun of you again! Yeah, that's what I thought. So Madeline tells Sarush that she wants nothing to do with his plans anymore, but when he threatens to kill Quasimodo, she relents and agrees to help him. Despite that, though, she doesn't actually tell him where the bell is, and yet he's able to find it anyway. I mean, to be fair, it is a bell in a bell tower. D did you really have to send someone up there at all? It's a bell tower, okay? You're gonna find the bell! So Madeline lures Quasimodo away while Sarouche enters the church to steal off Adele. And finds it pretty damn easily if you ask me. Bell tower! Looking for a bell? You're gonna fucking find one! Adve mysterium, obscuro tintinavolum, mirable visu. Um, excuse me, what? Okay, all of the magic from earlier in this film, you can chalk that up to parlor tricks and mirrors, or whatever. But that was literal witchcraft. You know, witchcraft, the thing that was a pretty big deal in the first movie. You know, the thing that Esmeralda nearly died for in the first movie. Witchcraft! Like, there's no way in hell that Sarouche can make a giant bell disappear like that using only smoke and mirrors. No, that was actual sorcery. I guess the only thing we need to beat Sarouche is a bucket of water, right? Like, just splash him. You foul little girl! You got me wet, Cassio! Cassio! So Sarouche makes off with the bell, and Madeline, for some convoluted reason, didn't tell Quasimodo about this beforehand like a smart person would. No! No, Quasi, please, just, just let me explain. You could have easily fixed it if you just told him the truth from the very beginning! God! I have no sympathy for this bitch now. Fuck this bitch! Jesus! Idiot! We gotta have the lie reveal though, for a while. Fuck off. So Zephyr follows Sarouche but ends up getting caught, and the dumbass actually tells Sarouche that his dad is Captain of the Guard. Captain of the Guard, eh? Uh, really? Okay, if this movie ends with Zephyr getting his throat slit all Red Wedding style, I will take everything I said about this movie back and call it the best directed video sequel on the spot. So Madeline reveals that Sarouche is using the catacombs from the first movie to escape the city, and they all go down there and find him. You got no way out! Oh, really? I see things a bit differently. Mama! Papa! Let him go! Let me pass safely and you may see your precious little boy again. Papa! Don't test me, Captain. Papa! Uh, you know what? Just kill them both, okay? We get the bell back and we get rid of Zephyr. It's a win-win. But Madeline convinces Quasi to trust her again, and they use her tightrope skills that she barely has in order to rescue Zephyr. You hold the rope, I'll do the rest. But wait, Quasimodo's been running around buildings his entire life. Doesn't it make more sense for him to go on the rope and for you to hold it, Madeline? The one thing she wants to do in her entire life, and she doesn't even have to fucking do it. So Zephyr is rescued, unfortunately. Sarush is arrested, and the bell is returned all in time for the festival. I was wrong. About all of it. Uh, no you weren't. You were actually 100% correct in your suspicions of the circus. Again, movie, that's a pretty iffy message you're putting out there. <laughs> oh, she better take good care of our boy. <laughs> Don't worry, I will. 
Huh? Why couldn't that happen earlier? And that was The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. And do I really need to say anything else about this movie, guys? You all know how bad it is. It's a burning hellfire of a film! While I do think the animation is actually pretty good for a direct-to-video sequel, everything else about this film really does suck. The villain is lackluster, the story is predictable from start to finish, the songs are forgettable and cheesy, the tone is nothing like the originals, and the romance, and especially our leading lady, is as dull as dry paint. It really hurts knowing that one of the greatest Disney films ever made with its amazing story, gorgeous animation, wonderful songs, and dark tone is carried on by this generic nothingness that plays itself so safe. Especially given the fact that the third film was pretty damn ballsy. Hell, literally setting the place on fire like that? Now that is risk taking. But as for this movie, it doesn't have much going for it. It's just a bland, forgettable mess. So I recommend finding some sanctuary from this awful film. And that was The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2, guys. I hope you all enjoyed it. So Chewie, what am I reviewing next time? In the most dangerous place on Earth, only the most fearsome creatures survive. Here's Normie! Ooh. Norm and the Lemmings are back. <laughs> I'll have that artifact if you don't mind. No. For a hard-hitting mission. Don't worry, I got this. What? <laughs> Excuse me, how do I get to the university? Study. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Way to go, Levy. Norm of the North, king-sized adventure. Just a tip, if you get thirsty, don't eat the yellow snow. Look for it on Blu-ray, DVD, and digital now. Oh, fuck me with a big black dragon, it's you guys again.